So good evening, folks. Uh, we're just going to stand by while uh, numbers start to climb here. Uh, Mick is having some technology challenges right now. He'll be joining us shortly uh, once uh, his uh, computer has rebooted. So uh, welcome, everyone. A special welcome to the Canadian Aviation and Space Museum, York University, Sacred Heart High School, and other RASC centers. So we're just watching the numbers climb here. We've got 59 so far. We'll just uh, hold for about another minute or so, and then we'll uh, we'll get things underway. Our numbers are still climbing, so I'll just hang in there for a minute. Okay, Chris, let's move to the next slide then. So just to remind you, we are recording this webinar for posterity. It will be available on our well-provisioned website at ottawa.rac.ca. If you have any questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Do not use the chat box. We don't monitor that. And a reminder that chat comments can be seen by everybody. And uh, please do not click on any nefarious links you may find in the chat box just for your own safety. Uh, raise hand has been disabled for this uh, webinar session. And we have a really exciting thing here tonight. Uh, we've got the folks from the Aviation and Space Museum, York University, and uh, some schools who have put forward some names for the name and exoplanet worlds. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jesse Rogerson, I believe, who's going to uh, take it away. So Chris is going to stop sharing. And here we go. Hello, everyone. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Bear with me. OK, there we go. And then if I press the same slide that you all just saw. So um, I am spotlit. Can we do two spotlights at the same time? Because uh, Cass would be uh, another yeah, one. Absolutely. Have. Just give us a second here. Um, just uh, while that's happening, there we go. Hello. Hi, Cass. Um, thank you, Rask, for um, having us tonight um, and letting us uh, do a cool little presentation and event. Um, I, I Just a personal note, I definitely, while I am no longer in Ottawa, uh, Ottawa, I still feel as like my home Rask unit. Um, there's, there's a couple of Rasks in my area in the GTA, but Ottawa is my home. So um, it's good to be back here tonight. <clears throat> so Cass and I here are going to just... Uh, have a, a short time with you tonight, uh, almost an hour, and we're going to talk about this thing called the Name Exo Worlds 2022 contest. So just a rundown, um, a little introduction of uh, what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to tell you who we are, what the contest is all about. We're going to present to you, well, we're not going to present some, um, there's a special guest who will present um, a name submission to this contest. And then after that, um, I'm going to give a little presentation on about 15 minutes on exoplanets and then we'll we'll do a vote at the end of that or all during that um so that's what we're what's going to happen tonight Cass. i'll pass it off to you <clears throat> sure hey everyone thanks so much jesse and thank you so much rask for uh, allowing us to host this event tonight uh, i'm just going to give a very quick repeat of that in french uh and and the rest of uh the the event will go as programmed in english so bienvenue à tous un concours a été lancé par L'Union Astronomique Internationale pour nommer les 20 exoplanètes euh, que le télescope euh, spatial James Webb a étudié euh, cette année. Et à ce but, nous avons formé une équipe qui consiste de York University, le Musée de l'Aviation et de l'Espace du Canada, l'Union Astronomique Royale du Canada, en plus de l'École secondaire Sacred Heart, et vous. Et ensemble, nous allons euh, vous présenter ce soir les noms euh, que nous avons soumis où uh, on planifie soumettre au concours et nous allons voter. Uh, et je vous encourage uh, fortement à participer à ce vote pour décider quel système planétaire que nous proposons à, à nommer. Donc, cet événement se déroulera en anglais, mais vous pouvez poser vos questions en français dans la boîte Q&A en fond de votre écran, si vous voulez. All right. Uh, back to you, Jessie. 
So there's us, uh, Cass and I. Um, we're, we're sort of hosting you through the next hour. <clears throat> um, and below there you see there's a, some logos. There's the York University logo, that's where I'm from. Um, there's the Aviation and Space Museum uh, logo, that's where Cass is from, and of course, RASC. And all us, our three organizations, plus um, a high school uh, in Stittsville, which we'll talk about in a moment, makes up the team tonight. So let's take a step back here. <clears throat> what is this contest? What is going on here? So the International Astronomical Union is the professional society of astronomers internationally. And they are the ones who decide on things like names, a variety of things, but they decide on names of things that are discovered. So if you find um, uh, a planet, if a planet was discovered, say in our solar system, the International Astronomical Union decides on the name. They are also the ones who decided that Pluto is a dwarf planet, not a planet. So you you can, that, that will tell you whether or not you like them or not. Um, so um, I am myself, I'm a member of the IAU, though I did not, was I was not a member at the time of the voting of Pluto. So don't blame me for that. Um, so they, the IAU decided that, okay, there's all these amazing exoplanets out there. There's over 5,000 that we've discovered. There's many, many more likely, many millions more probably. And they're running this contest and they're going to officially name 20 of those exoplanets that have been discovered. Uh, and in order to do this, anybody can do this, but you have to, to, in order to be part of this contest, you have to follow these three things. You have to create a team. So that's what we did. We put a team together of myself, CAST, so the York University, the Aviation and Space Museum, and then RASC as well, um, helping us put this together. And then we also reached out to a school group, a couple of school groups, um, in and one of them is here tonight, which we'll talk to in a minute. Then that team is supposed to do some research and develop a, a name a proposal for both the exoplanet and the star that the exoplanet goes around, orbits, and then host an event and talk about exoplanets. And that's what tonight is, we're hosting this event. So here is our team. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass it off to Cass because I've already talked about the top three, but I want to just let Cass introduce um, Mr. Clark and the Sacred Heart High School. Thanks, Jesse. So, yeah, I reached out to Mr. Sean Clark, uh, who is a teacher at Sacred Heart High School in Stittsville. He's the science department head there. Uh, and he also happens to have been to the Arctic with me recently um, to to study Mars in the Arctic. Uh, so he's no stranger to space themes uh, and his students did such a fabulous job. Uh, and so I'm, I would, I'm really excited to have him here to be able to represent um, his classes, his grade nine classes that, that really did uh, come together and propose the names for us. And a special shout out to Andorra, um, who I know one of his students who did a lot of work on this and I'm sure he's gonna touch on that as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to Mr. Clark to um, present your names. Okay, uh, thanks for having us. Thanks again, Cass, for the invitation. It was, it was a fun little opportunity. Um, I teach three different grade nine classes. So we kind of, I wanna get them all involved. So I prime them a couple of days before uh, with the links that you sent uh, to the Exo Worlds competition and some resources that were on there. And then the NASA dashboard on exoplanets. So we talked a little bit about that. And then we came back and I guess it was uh, earlier this week, I just sort of said sort of last 15 minutes of class for each of my three classes, we just had like a brainstorming session and we had posters all around the room with different themes. Uh, I had like a poster for places, like if you wanted to brainstorm names of places. And then there was cute random pairings of names. So the kids were coming up with names like alphabet and uh, pumpkin spice and stuff like that. Like they were just like literally throwing everything at the wall to see what would stick. Um, because we just finished learning about chemistry and the periodic table, and I find ways of cramming space into every unit that we do, we talked about how some of the elements got their names from planets like uranium. There's a mercury connection, but I don't think it was really after the planet. It was more the idea of Quicksilver. Um, but we talked about uranium and Pluto or Uranus and Pluto became uranium and plutonium uh, and things like that. Um, and so one of the categories we had was elements. And so kids were just kind of picking their favorite elements, the elements we learned about. And one of my students by period four that day, so it was it was an evolution of everybody throwing their ideas on the wall and then the next people behind them would kind of come around to that poster 
or, you know, an hour later in the next class, they come around to that poster and add their ideas. And then Dora and uh, McGlinchey and a couple of students that she was working with came up with the idea of plutonium and, or sorry, polonium and radium. Uh, and so we thought that was really cute because rays, like as in radium was named after radiation, polonium was actually named after Poland, uh, which is, you know, it's a landmass at somebody's home and this could be somebody's home too. Um, and they were both discovered by Marie Curie, which then the students started talking about that back and forth. And they're like, Mary Curie? No, it's not Mary Curie, it's Marie. And before you knew it, they were saying the name so fast. One student said, Mercury, that's already a planet. And then all the, like, the, we just went off on a tangent on that. So we thought that the connection was kind of cute. And so I sent Andorra home with some homework that night. And I said, take a look at the list of 20 planets that are being considered. See if any of them have connections to Mercury, right? So are they a similar radius? Are they similar mass to Mercury? Uh, and so we, I gave her a quick little primer on, on some planetary properties and off she went. So she emails me a couple hours later and I was putting together a Google form so that all three of my classes could vote on their favorite choices. And she emailed me an hour later with this list of several different connections. One of the planets was kind of within Mercury's orbit. It was probably one of the, 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 the broader uh, orbital radiuses. Um, and we kind of liked that one. Another one of the planets was actually within the same, or sorry, actually had the same temperature as Mercury. And we really liked that one. And then she mentioned that uh, the, the planet, or sorry, which one was it? WASP-166 is in the constellation Hydra. And the Latin name for Mercury, where it gets its elemental uh, symbol HG, is Hydrogyrum. Uh, so she just fell all over that. And I thought that that was spectacular. Um, and then, so the next morning, everybody voted on it that night. I put up a little Google doc and actually deja vu was slightly ahead, but then we realized we wouldn't be able to name subsequent planets with that. Right. So we kind of, we, we ended up coming back to, uh, the polonium and radium. And the next morning we got to talking about it. We said, well, you know, the, the element names for the other planets in our solar system aren't the same as the planet names. So we said, well, what if we called it like Polonii or, and one of the students said Polonius. And that, that sounded really familiar. So we started scratching our heads and somebody got on Google and said, oh, it's a character in Hamlet. And then we're like, well, of course, all the moons of Uranus, another radioactive element are all named after Shakespearean characters. So why not have a planet named after Shakespearean characters? And that's kind of where we got to. So it was this neat sort of combination of idea here, idea there, some connections, some meaningful connections. I know we weren't supposed to name the planets after a person, but I thought if we're going to make it to any of these planets someday, having radioactive elements at our disposal is going to be a big piece of the puzzle. So why not name them after Marie Curie? So that, that was our story. That's a, such a good story. I was hanging on every word there. That was, <laughs> yeah. that was wonderful. I, I, I can't believe it. That was, that's a incredible work by yourself, by the, 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 your three classes. What I really love about this story is that not only were you sending them ho with home with homework and Dora specifically, and she did it, but then that night you had a Google form and they voted in the evening. This is, this is great. Those kids were into it. <laughs> okay. So where do we go from here? So you're, what we got, what we got now is we have the, this name submission that we're going to put forward as a team. Uh, we got Polonius for the for the planet. We got Radium for the, the star. Great names. Now, um, what we're going to, I'm just going to introduce this idea and then I'll dive into, because we, we have something to vote on everybody. So as Sean was saying, there's a list of planets. There's 20 planets, 20, um, around 20 stars that are going to be named. Uh, and so hopefully this name that Sean and his class are putting forward, um, hopefully one of these that you see on the sky here, this is an all sky image showing where all of these planet star combinations are. Hopefully one of those is gonna be named polonium or polonius and radium. Um, so the question is, which ones do, wh which, which ones are we gonna put forward as, wh which combo, sorry, is the one that we're gonna put forward. So there's, there's all the locations of them right there. And here's them in a nice table because I like tables. And uh, Sean has already talked about a couple of these. And so I'm just, I'm gonna highlight three. I'm gonna hi highlight three of them. 
These are three here. There's the HAT P26 system, the HATS 72 system, and the WASP 166 system. And those are the three that we're gonna vote on tonight as a group. Now, why these systems? So Sean, you already, I think you already talked about these. So I'm gonna let you talk, if you don't mind, I'm gonna let you talk about the first two because those are the two that you were talking about. So here's the first one. Okay, so that's HATS 72. Uh, that's the one, again, full credit to Andorra for this. Uh, I just sent I just sent her a way to do the legwork, right? Here's the resources, go do the work. Um, and that's the one that she came back to me and said it's got a surface temperature of 740 Kelvin, which we haven't even talked about temperature in Kelvin yet. And she came back to me with this and said Kelvin. She didn't say degrees Kelvin, so I was totally excited by that. Um, so which Mercury's temperature ranges from 90 to 740 Kelvin. And I mean, at this point, she even admitted some of these she was really reaching, but she's like, this is as close as I could come up with with connections. Um, so that was hat 72 B. Okay. Hat 70. That's a good, I like, I like it though. I don't think it's a, it's too much of a stretch. What about this one here? Sorry. There's something in the way. Wasp, uh, wasp. No, I had wasp 166. Yeah. Yeah. That's wasp, the one sorry, I got yeah wasp 166. Yep. Sorry. There was something blocking there. I had to get rid of it. Um, again, that's the one in the constellation Hydra. And we're always talking about the, you know, the atomic names. And it, again, it's, it's a connection back to Mercury through those other elements, which, you know, you only get Mercury if you say Mary Curie as fast as Quicksilver would say it. So um, that's, uh, that was kind of our connection. That's so there. perfect. And that's the one she said, she even put in brackets in, in her email to me. She said, I know it's a little far-fetched, but I sometimes like far-fetched. And just as a sign, when I was out walking the dog this morning at six o'clock, we looked up in the eastern sky and there was Mercury. And like myself and the other dog walkers, they're all like, what is that? I'm like, oh my God. Like you never see Mercury, right? But <laughs> there it was this morning. So that that's, I'm, I'm leaning heavy on the Mercury connect. I, I like this Mercury connection too. And I like, this is my favorite one, Wasp 166 with the, uh, hi, I don't even know if I can pronounce this, hydro, Hydrargerum, Hydrargerum. Close enough, right? I don't speak Latin, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I threw this one in um, just so that we had three to vote on. Um, because I was looking through the systems as well, going on your on your Mercury connection, Mercury Curie, Mercury connection, and realized that the HAT P26 system is in Virgo. And currently, today, right now, Mercury is in Virgo. Though I will say to everybody voting, this one might not make any sense because Mercury is not going to be in Virgo frequently. So... <laughs> Just keep that in mind. Funny enough, I'm just looking at her email and of the connections that she did send me, she mentioned that uh, GL486 and HAT P226 are currently in Virgo. So there you go. There you go. So she, she's, Smart, she's on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So there's the three of them. So I, I guess um, here, what we're going to do is we're going to start the vote now, Cass. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. So what we're going to do is we, there's the three there. And we're gonna, um, if I can, our Rask overlords, there's a, um, in within the Zoom, there's a, the polling option that we have. We're gonna start this poll on this and we're gonna just leave it open while I give my presentation about exoplanets and then let people play with it. And then like in 15 minutes, we'll reveal the winner. Does that sound good to everybody? Cool, all right. Oh, there it is. Although I vote for, yeah. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna vote. Note so you don't have to vote immediately. You can vote, you know, as you're understanding exoplanets more as Jesse's telling you all about them for those that are um, new to the concept. Yes, and I think that once you do vote, I don't think you get to vote again. Like, yeah, I don't think you go, can go back and change. So if you want to hold off on your vote, then, then hold off. Okay, so I'm just going to go pull this aside. Sean, where'd you go? There you are. Sean, thank you so much for uh, presenting that. That was really cool. And um, congrats to your class and, and congrats to Andorra. That was really, really great work. Okay. Now you get to all listen to me. Um, okay, play, there we go. And, oh, no, I'm not sharing my screen. You think that we would be good at this, right? I've been doing this for two years, three years. I don't know. There we go. There we go. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is just spend 15 minutes talking about some highlight, what, bring it to the basics, 
what's an exoplanet? What do we know about them? What's the future look like? And if we're going to talk about exoplanets, first, we should understand what's a planet, right? I mean, we all kind of have a, a rough idea of what a planet is. Here is a um, the general schematic you would see in, in any textbook where you have the sun on the left and then the far reaches of the solar system on the right and then a bunch of stuff. And we, we tend to think about planets nowadays um, as the things that orbit the sun, uh, but it, it obviously got a little bit more nuanced back in 2006. Um, but we have our four, our, our four terrestrial planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then we have our four gas planets, two gas planets, two ice giant planets, um, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that orbits the sun. Um, Pluto isn't considered a planet anymore because it's part of a larger belt of objects that we call the Kuiper belt as the same with Ceres, which is in the asteroid belt. It's part of a larger belt of objects. So that's, those are the, the planets that we know. They're the things that orbit the, the, the sun. They're round, they're complex, they're, they're interesting places, but the, I'm sure all of you have done this before. I know I've done it hundreds, thousands of times where you, you're sitting out under a wonderful sky one night, maybe you're camping or maybe you're just in your backyard or you're out on a walk or whatever and you see all those stars and you can't help but wonder what's going on up there in the universe. There's all those stars that those stars are supposed to be kind of like our star, the sun. Do any of them have planets? That's a very good wonder, a good wonder to have. And this is what we define as an extrasolar planet. It's a planet or an extrasolar, or we shorten it to exo, exoplanet, is a planet that is outside our solar system. Now, usually this means that those planets are orbiting other stars. Mostly that's what we mean by this, but that doesn't only mean that because you can have planets that are just in between stars, floating around, not attached to anything. We call them rogue planets, and we have found a few of them. But normally what we mean is when you look up at the night sky and you see the stars, those stars have planets orbiting them. Now it's tough to see, you can't really tell in these images, right? There's a picture of a bunch of stars. How, do, how, can you find, how can you find them? How do you know if there's planets orbiting those stars? Well, it turns out the scientists have found many interesting ways to do this. Um, there are currently five major methods by which we can investigate these stars to see if they have planets orbiting them. And here's the five right here that we'll go through. Definitely the most popular and most successful is the transit method, but we're, I'm gonna take you through each one so you get a sense for what's going on here. Okay, so the first one. One thing you need to remember is that when, you're, when we're looking at uh, a star and a planet com combination with a planet orbiting around the star, is that yes, the planet is moving. The planet is moving around and around, but that planet, has a little bit of its own gravity that's pulling on the star as well. So the star itself is also doing just a little motion in the sky. And if I play this video, this first method, in, fr in fact, this was the method we used the, the first time we found an exoplanet back in 1990, depending on who you talk to in 1995, um, the first time we found a planet was using this method, the radial velocity method, and it was, what, the way it was done was, yes, this is what a star planet combination does exaggerated. But if we look at it from earth, what we notice is that the color of the star slightly changes. It goes redder and bluer, redder and bluer, redder and bluer over and over periodically. And this is a result of the star wobbling and doing a little Doppler shift in its light. So the star itself changes, changes color a little bit and then we infer that a planet is causing that wobble to occur. And then we can measure things about that interesting planet. So the first one that we did that for was 50, oh my, 56 peg, 56 Pegasus, I believe, was a, a, a planet in Pegasus constellation. Since then, since 1995, we've found over a thousand planets using this method. So you point a telescope at a star and you watch that star subtly change its color as a result of a planet orbiting it. Notice this is indirect. We're not measuring the planet, we're measuring the star. The next one, and by far the most popular one and um, the coolest one, in my opinion, is the transit method. This is responsible for almost 4,000 discoveries so far, largely thanks to the Kepler Space Telescope. And the way this one works is you 
you are hoping that when you point your telescope at a star, you're hoping that you're looking at the star at the perfect angle that any planets that are there, if they are there, happen to pass in between you and the star. And this would look something like this. So here's the star, there's the planet going around it. If you're looking at it top down, that's what you see. But if you look at it from the side, if we just happen to be looking at it at the right angle, the planet will pass in front of the star and block a little tiny bit of light from the star for a short period of time. And if you keep watching that star over large amounts of time, you will see that planet continually pass in front, oops, continually pass in front and block light. You'll get little dips every month or every two months or every year or every three years, depending on how long it takes for that planet to go around. Just like that. There was a telescope built specifically to do this called the Kepler Space Telescope, and it found many, many, many exoplanets, by far the most successful. Jesse, we have a question. Oh, yes. Does the planet have to be a certain size and mass to be able to move the star? Oh my gosh, that's a good question. Technically, no. All Anything with mass pulls on anything else with mass. Uh, that's the fundamental of gravity. Um, now, you're, But you're hitting on something important, right? The bigger a planet is, the more able it is to wobble the star. So a big, huge planet like Jupiter would wobble the star a lot. A little tiny planet like Mercury would wobble the star a little, which probably makes you think, oh, okay, wait, that means big planets are going to be easier to find and little planets are going to be harder to find, which is absolutely true. There's also an added co complication of distance. So if, the, if it's a big planet like Jupiter and it's really far, then it won't wobble the star as much. But if it's really close, then it wobble a lot. So it's a combination of things. But we are, when we first started observing these wobbles and these, um, and these transits, it was much, much easier for us to find the big ones because they, were, they created the most obvious uh, signals in the data. But over like the last 20 years, it's incredible how good the scientists have gotten at teasing out little tiny wobbles from little tiny planets. Okay, we have, we have two more questions here. They're okay. sort of related. How do we know it, it is only one exoplanet which is causing the wobble? And can you <laughs> infer the existence of multiple planets with wobbles or only cases with single planets? Oh my gosh, another great question. Um, great question. So it, that's about wobble timing. And you are watching, you're, you're seeing the, you're measuring the wobble of the star, but if it's multiple planets there, then the wobble won't be a nice, perfect period. It won't be perfect, like back and forth, back and forth. It's going to be like, kind of like a little bit of a chaotic, I don't know how to describe it, a weird, a weird wobble where it, it doesn't do it exactly perfectly periodic every time. And so then what we do is we use computational models to, to say, okay, if there's two planets, would, would it do, would it make the signal we see? If there's three planets, would it make the signal we see? It becomes much more challenging, but we are able to do it. Okay, that's it one? for the good. No, that's that's it. Yeah. Okay, good. Cool. Those are good questions, man. Okay, what's what do I got next? Okay, the third method, much much more difficult, is directly imaging. Notice that the first two the first two types of uh, finding planet methods um, are indirect methods. You're not observing the planet. You're observing the star and inferring a planet exists. But we can and have found 61 planets through direct imaging, literally taking pictures of the planets. And the way we do that is what you're looking at on the screen here is this is an image of a zoomed in star really, really far away. So it kind of looks all grainy and weird, but the stars are so bright that it actually makes it almost impossible to see if there's any planets around them. So what we need to do is in our telescopes, we put over top of the star, a big disc to block the light from the star so that we can see if there's any planets around it. It's much harder to do. It's the planets are dim and the stars are bright, but we have done it. And the, what do I got here? The, oh yeah, gravitational lensing. <clears throat> so gravitational lensing, this is a, this is a really interesting way of finding planets. Gravi the, uh, the act of gra gravitational lensing is the idea that a massive object like a star or a planet can bend light. That's the idea. And so if you have light going near a star um, from a background star, 
it will bend around it. Okay, I have a video that'll be a lot easier to explain this. Um, what you see here is there's a star that's shining light in all directions. And then what you see here is a star planet combination passing in between us and the background star. There's the background star. So what we can do is we can actually watch as um, planet star combinations go are moving around in space and they get near background light, we can watch how the light gets bent and then infer if planets are there or not. If a star, if it's just a star with no planets, the light will get bent one way. If it's a planet star combination, the light will get bent slightly differently. And we can use our math and our cool science and our understanding of general relativity to tease out if there's any planets there. Surprisingly, we've done this 136 times. Some really, really fantastic surveys have helped figure this out. And finally, the final method is called astrometry. So this is sort of similar to the first one, but I'll explain the difference. Remember how I said how a, a big planet or any planet will cause a wobble in the star. Now, we don't actually measure the star with the, with the, um, the wobble method. What we're measuring actually is the change in color of the star as a result of it wobbling. However, we do have some pretty good telescopes that are, are really um, good at astrometry, which is the measurement of position on the sky. And we've been able twice, scientists have now been able to confirm twice to actually observe that physical motion, the physical wobble of a star um, over time. So you could, if you actually watch the star, you would physically see it moving sideways and backwards um, through, the, through space as a result of the, the planet orbiting it. So that's a much harder thing to do, but we have been able to do it. Now you know the five methods by which we find exoplanets. The transit method is by far the most successful and is one of the main reasons we have over 5,000 discovered so far. And what awesome instruments have we done used to find all of these exoplanets? Well, the Kepler Space Telescope, by far the workhorse here was launched in 2009, I think, and uh, was operational for six, seven years or so. Uh, took over from that was TESS, which is currently up there in space um, observing transits, exoplanet transits. And of course we have Webb, which is doing some insane stuff. And then there's a bunch of other missions, and we do a lot of work from the ground. There's a lot of telescopes on the ground that, that search for this stuff. But here, I'm going to give you the big like home run here of exoplanet research, because I really, this is my favorite thing to talk about. How much time do I have? I don't know. Where am I at? OK. <laughs> OK, good. What have we found so far? So using all of those methods, this is, I, I pulled this off NASA website. You can see the 13th, so a few days ago. And we've confirmed 5,100 planets that are orbiting, or most of them are orbiting other stars. There's almost 9,000 other candidates that have yet to be confirmed. That's interesting. And we have 38 planet 3,800 planetary systems. What that means is that these 5,000, uh, many of them are multiple planets orbiting one star. So there are 3,800 systems with multiple, and some have multiple planets. But here's the interesting science that have, we've done, we've learned since observing exoplanets. Let's start with this chart here. What you see here is number of planets that we've discovered on the left with a breakdown of mass on the bottom here or actually, sorry, a breakdown of radius on the body, the bottom here. Um, what you see right here in this one is Mars size objects, things the size of Mars. Here's things the size of Earth. There's things called super Earths, things called sub Neptunes. There's a Neptune sized planet. There's a Jupiter sized planet. And then there's a bigger, bigger than Jupiter. Here is a, the, the cool part about this slide. In our solar system, we have Earth sized planets. And then the next planets above that in size are Neptune-sized planets. What we don't have are super-Earths and sub-Neptunes. But if you look at the data, that is the most common planet in the universe. So we have our solar system that is without the most common type of planet. 
what we call a, a super earth or a sub Neptune. And then you have on the left here, just sort of breaking these down terrestrial earth sized planets. We have gas giant planets, we have Neptune planets, but this super earth planet, this planet that's bigger than earth, but not as big as Neptune is a very common type of planet that we just don't have in our solar system. Absolutely wild. I see some, oh, no, no questions. Okay, back, okay, let's loop this back in to JWST because that's why we're here. Um, the International Astronomical Union is running this contest to name 20 planets that are going to be observed by JWST. JWST is a the James Webb Space Telescope launched back in on Christmas Day, or like last year, surprise, and it got up there and it, it was commissioned and started taking data in May, June, um, is a collaboration between three space agencies. Canada is all over this mission. We are one of the one of the most important we have created one of the uh two of the most important instruments on that a camera and a fine guidance system um nasa and the european space agency also incredible players in this it is a really great um mission and it is producing some amazing data let me show you oh wait i see a question Ooh, if thea hadn't happened would the earth had been a super earth that's a really good question. I have never thought of that before. Thea, to, for those wondering, is the um, suspected name, the name of the suspected object that smashed into Earth and um, created the Earth moon system. So here's my, based on my initial reaction would be probably not, because if you added the mass of the moon and Earth together, I don't think you would get a significantly large difference than just Earth together, Earth on its own, meaning I don't think you get to like the super Earth size with the, the mass of those two combined. So I don't, I don't think so, uh, but I guess it depends on how much debris was lost. I imagine most debris would have fallen back to the Earth or to the moon. That's my guess, but I don't know. Okay. So let me show you, right. So the reason I'm talking about JWST is because the contest winners, they're, the, whoever wins these contests, the planet is gonna be observed by J, JWST. And I wanna show you what JWST can do. This was some recent data. So there's the link there um, down at the bottom um, of the exoplanet WASP-39b. What they did with JWST is they pointed the telescope at the star that this planet orbits collected some data, and then not only were they able to see that the planet was there, but they then were able to measure the atmosphere of that planet. And what they found is a clear, strong signal of carbon dioxide in that atmosphere. Now, this is something that has been almost impossible to do before JWST was launched. Before JWST got working on exoplanets, we really only could find exoplanets, measure their masses, and make some guesses about what they're like based on temperatures and stuff. But we couldn't measure, we couldn't really measure their physical properties. We couldn't even tell if they had atmospheres, let, or, let alone it, what those atmospheres are made of. JWST gets launched, points its amazing telescope uh, mirrors at WASP-39b and proves that this not only doesn't have an atmosphere, but it's made of carbon or it has carbon dioxide in it. And so there's the signal there. And you might wonder, um, how can you possibly study an exoplanet atmosphere? Well, the way you do this is you first look at the star on its own and you look at the rainbow that it creates, the light from the star. Then you look at the light that passes through this, the planet's atmosphere and you look at the, the spectrum that's created there. And then you subtract one from the other, and that tells you the signal coming only from the planet. So I can play this video again, um, just because uh, it's kind of quick, but basically it's taking advantage of the transit method, the idea that the planets are passing in front of the star. You can look at the starlight that goes through the potential atmosphere that's there and pick up material that's in it. Pick up whether it's carbon dioxide, whether it's water, whether it's methane. You could pick up signatures of, of biology, like water and methane and carbon dioxide, things that potentially could mean life are there. Um, 
so, or you could pick up things that mean, that mean no life are there, like hydrogen, for uh, a hydrogen atmosphere, for example, like Jupiter. So JWST is a, a powerhouse for this. It's got these 20 ex exoplanets to look at. Hopefully the one that we put together that the Mr. Clark and his team have put together is gonna be one of these here, one of those um, 20. There's the three that we're voting on and I'll bring the vote back up. And I wonder if I could, that's that's my the end of my presentation on exoplanets. And I, I think we can loop back up to the vote and see what we got. And as we're waiting on that, I just want to say thanks so much, Jesse. That was so informative. That was an amazing presentation. And I love just how much information we can get from squiggly lines. I know. <laughs> it's incredible. It's it's the squiggly line science. <laughs> it it blows my mind. Yeah, the squiggly line science. That's a good way of saying it. Yeah. Jesse, it's uh, Chris with a question for you. Yes. Uh, we had talked in the planning for this meeting about leaving the poll up uh, a little longer through the break. Do you feel you've left it long enough? Uh, yes, that's a I can tell you right question. now that 62 people have cast their vote out of uh, 85 people in attendance. So there, uh, if, if anyone's been waiting to listen to your talk, uh, now's the time for them to, uh, to vote before we... Uh, uh, close the poll and announce the results. Mm. So, Chris, the panelists, uh, you need to subtract their number from the total because they cannot vote. Uh, no, that's not correct. Panelists can vote. Yeah. Co Co-hosts can oh, vote. Oh, co-hosts. So oh, sorry, sorry Dave, that, that was me. You and I are, are conflicted out of voting. Yeah. Okay, that, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> I bought a t-shirt that says, I love squiggly line science. <laughs> me too, Kim. Someone make those. Um, okay, so I, I wonder uh, if we have, I feel like we can get a few more votes out of this. There's 80, 80 something people here uh, and we only have 65 votes. Come on people, if you haven't voted yet, here's the three systems that we are putting forward. Um, really cool connections uh, to, especially the first two, um, to the, the names that were uh, brought forward by the team. Um, so throw your, throw your votes in there. I don't want uh, I don't want anybody to be left out. And uh, maybe we do maybe we should leave it open. Oh, there's another question. Oh no, Brian. Sorry, Brian. Brian says there's two of us, two of them at one com computer, but can only cast but can't cast two votes. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you now, Jesse, uh, your plea to have people cast their vote and finish uh, has still left us at 65. We're static there, so maybe uh, we have what we're going to get. And uh, if you want, I can end it and show the results. Mm -hmm. Is that cool with everybody? I think so. I think that's a pretty yeah. close to critical mass, right? And there's a fairly definitive winner here without okay okay <laughs> it might have been All influenced right. by the presentation but we'll see yeah. <laughs> Let, okay. let's um let's let's end it there okay and, uh, let's see what the results are i first. have closed the poll okay. and da -da 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 -da. Oh. yeah ah. yay that was my favorite too that's the one i voted for <laughs> me too <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, cool. okay, so, lost 166. <laughs> yes, sorry, Cass, um, to speak over you. Um, the winner is WASP 166, the system that is in the direction of the Hydra constellation. Um, and the Latin name for Mercury, the element, not Mercury, the planet, is Hydrargerum. Hydrargerum. So oh. that's cool. So to sum summarize everything here, this team, Rask, York, Chasm, Mr. Clark's awesome grade nines. Um, we are going to put this submission um, forward with WASP 166 as the as the system and uh, Polon polonium, wait, Polonius and Radium as the name, Polonius for the planet and Radium for the star. Thank you everybody to this team. Thank you everybody voting. Hopefully we win. Go us. Yes, he does. Mick him. <clears throat> Okay, that brings us back to our meeting and it's all yours, Mick.
Okay, I just need to check that you can hear me. Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, good evening, all. And before getting on with business, I do need to register a complaint. And any of you that have been at the meetings over the last 10 months can probably anticipate what my complaint is going to be. Uh, it's the fact that of those three candidates for the naming contest, not a single one of them was in the Southern Hemisphere. I think this is just another egregious example of boreocentrism and that the young people of Canada should be being educated in a more broad and global manner. And that's the end of my rant. Okay, so good evening all. I'm sorry I was late. The technology gods uh, didn't like my last offering. Uh, many thanks to Jesse and Cass for organising the contest for us, getting a result. Let's see how it moves up through the IAU's mechanisms. Rest of our program for tonight, we're going to have our normal monthly sky update from Dave Chisholm. Then that'll take us up to the break and our Astro Trivia. Following the break, uh, we're introducing a new section here. And uh, I hope it'll be a recurrent one. And I'll give you the full insight about that after the break. But that'll be led off, being led off by Andrea Gironez. We'll then have our observation reports, the monthly observing challenges, and the usual set of announcements. So with that, over to you, Dave. Oh, sorry, I didn't realise we are going into uh, uh, the sort of housekeeping stuff. So we've got eight new members over the last month. Welcome to Adam, Mia, Jerry, Joseph, Caroline, Andrew, Jocelyn, and Steve, if you're on the line. Welcome. And uh, I'll be coming after you to look for potential uh, presentations in 2023 total of 49 new members so far this year. Next one, please. Uh, we do have one uh, item, a member in the news. Uh, perhaps, Chris, you're better positioned to talk to this than me. Um, okay, I wasn't prepared for this. Um, yeah, this was an unfortunate piece of news uh, that we picked up in the Ottawa Citizen obituaries. Uh, while I don't know Frank well, uh, I certainly recognize him as a very regular attendee at our at our monthly meetings. I've seen him at star parties, at Starfest. Uh, I've been with the uh, the Ottawa Centre for uh, for many many years. So it's sad to see him uh, passing on. Okay, so yes, it's always sad to lose a member, particularly one that has been uh, well known and uh, appreciated. So rest well, Francis. Next, please. Usual bribes for joining up with the uh, Royal Astronomical Society, either through the regular membership, your family memberships, or as uh, a, a youth member. Next, please. Benefits for so doing. What do you get for your money? In post-COVID times, you will again have access to the 10 Bean Telescope Loan Library out at our CASM, as well as our physical book library. Meanwhile, as a member, you have access to the Fred Lossing Observatory outside of Ottawa and the right to participate in the RASC Observer Program certification activities. Next, Mick, please. If I can just correct one little yeah. tiny thing you mentioned there, the Ted Bean Loan Library is available, notwithstanding COVID. It's not housed at the Aviation Museum. I, and, I did uh, not know that, Chris. And I've sensed that others haven't known that. So uh, good to let people know it's uh, it's available. And if people want access to a telescope, uh, they need to send an email to one of us. And start with me as secretary at uh, ottawa.rasc.ca and we will put you in contact with the librarian who's happy to uh, to help you excellent thanks chris um, boy you get so much education in these meetings uh, next slide please as member you also get access to the physical publications uh, sky news bi-monthly the slightly more academically inclined journal also bi-monthly the annual observers handbook and as an Ottawa member, you get a copy of our fabulously well 
structured astronauts newsletter. Next, please. My personal recommendation for joining is the great people that you are going to meet, deal with, and be able to work with, depending on your interests, whether that's our presenters, whether it's other members, it, it's all excellent value for money and get out there and buy your membership now. Thank you. Okay, and now I think it will be over to Dave with this month's Sky update. Okay, so uh, let's see what's happening in the Ottawa skies for the month of October. We're halfway through the month. So uh, yeah, sorry you missed it. The full moon was last Sunday, I believe. Yes, on the 9th. And that moon was has, was traditionally known by the local Indigenous people as the hunter's moon. Because at this time of the year, the leaves are falling, the game is fat and ready to hunt. This moon has also been known as the travel moon and the blood moon. We have the new moon on the 25th. We have the Orionids uh, meter sh shower, uh, best viewed after midnight, 20 meters per hour, remnants from the dust of Halley's Comet. And uh, if we remember from the previous slide, there's just going to be a thin crescent moon that night. So it should be a good viewing for that one. Uh, it's an average meteor shower, about 20 meteors per hour at its peak. And it ranges from October 2nd to November 7th. So they're up there right now, but they will peak on the 21st and 22nd of October. The Northern Tords meteor shower. Um, this will actually happen the night of our next meeting. So um, once we finish our meeting uh, next month, uh, get out and take a look at these. Um, it's a five to ten meters per hour meteors per hour, so it's not as not as busy as the previous one. Um, but it's going to be hampered by the fact that it's almost a full moon at that time. But uh, that will be happening the same night as our next meeting. As you can see, our uh, hours of sunlight are getting shorter and shorter. And by the time of our next meeting, we'll have flipped to standard time. So we'll be able to start our observing sessions uh, an hour earlier. Mercury, uh, another one of these, uh, sorry you missed it, but uh, as our uh, science teacher mentioned, he saw Mercury the other day uh, because it's at its greatest Western elongation on the 8th. And uh, it's just before sunrise, and uh, that's the best time to observe it. Venus is not visible. It's rising and setting with the sun right now. Mars is uh, coming up earlier and earlier every evening by the end of the month. We'll be able to it'll be at the horizon at a quarter after eight, which means that we can probably see it by nine o'clock in the evening. Jupiter is up in the sky, nice and bright up there this evening, and it will remain up there throughout the whole month. And Saturn as well. Uranus is visible in the evening and through the night, uh, as is uh, Neptune. And here's our cartoon of the month. There you go. Thank you, folks. Thank you, David. That's not at all sexist, is it? No, I was a little worried about that, but anyways. <laughs> okay. Thank you as always. So, Chris, brings us up to the bio break. Uh, those of you who uh, are registered for this through the website would have noted that I'd uh, posted a piece of trivia on the website concerning the fact that the mass loss of our... Our, our sun uh, corresponds to something like 30,000, the mass of 30,000 blue whales per second. And that the sun has been doing that every second for approximately 5 billion years and is likely to uh, continue to do it for another 5 billion. Which brings us to this concept of just how damn big the sun is. Do the maths and you can find that a commercial jet airliner would take about six months to fly around the equator of the sun. That's how big it is. That's a lot of 
in flight food DAF to get through as well. However, the largest known star, Uoscuti, is considerably larger and therefore it would take considerably longer to fly an aircraft around this hypergiant of a star. The question for tonight's bio break is how long would a commercial plane take to fly around UI Scooty's equator? And I'll see you in five minutes. <laughs> I bet you they looked it up. I see Dave proposing not only an answer, but his analysis and how we got to that number. <laughs> how did I, I don't think I came to give you the right, correct final answer. Hang on a second. He's changing his mind already. Uh, sorry, that should be. Uh, I was looking at the wrong part of my calculator here. 5,341 years. It sounds like a fun kind of question for, uh, for Sean Clark to put to some students. <laughs> oh boy, but it's like an auction. It keeps going up and up. The math might be a little bit beyond most of them. <laughs> <laughs> the concept that? is easy. <laughs> Alrighty, I think we can go back to to the real business of the evening, Chris. So, the answer: How long would it take an aircraft to fly around Uo Scuti, given that it's seventeen hundred times the radius of the sun, and given that it takes about six months for a plane to fly around the sun? And you're going to get an answer of around eight hundred and fifty years to fly around the equator of Uo Scuti. Maybe you've got to halve that. <laughs> the bit I found interesting in putting this one together, going back to mass and other characteristics of the sun, the volume of UI Scooty is 5 billion times that of the sun, but it's only 10 solar masses. So it's less dense than aerogel. That star has an average density that is comparable to an industrial vacuum on Earth which I think is <laughs> mind-blowing. All righty, next slide, please, Chris. So our new session tonight, to be led by Andrea, it is coming live. It's never before been seen on television. It's new, improved, and recommended by dentists. Next slide, please. A prosaic title for this section, would be useful basic information for novice astronomers who find getting started rather intimidating. Hopefully, a catchier title being 10-minute tech tips types, tricks and traps for tyros gives the sense of what we're doing here. Are you confused? Are you brain boggled by what it takes to get started in astronomy? Are you overwhelmed? You don't know whether you need a dilithium copy holder, what colour your duct tape should be, or whether you need an IR perihectometer. In each meeting from now on, there's going to be a 10-minute hands-on-ish session where the people who know the answers to these, have experiences to share, will be on hand to show us how to do things right and hopefully how they've got things wrong as well in the past. So first off for tonight, Andrea, over to you, please. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you're good. All right. I have 10 minutes 
to tell you all about how to take a picture of the lunar eclipse. And the reason we're talking about this is there is going to be a total lunar eclipse next uh, month. It's on November 8th, but it's the morning of November 8th. So it's the night of the 7th going into the 8th. That's kind of important. So we're going to run through how to do this because the moon is actually one of the easiest um, images to take. There's a few tricks with an eclipse, and we're going to go through that now. Next, please. So here are the basics. This eclipse happens at, before dawn. So it'll begin a couple of hours before dawn, and you will have a total eclipse, uh, moon, uh, totally eclipsed moon setting um, just as totality ends. So this, you will want to have a flat Western horizon because you can actually get the setting into a lake or into the mountains. You can time this eclipse with a landscape. There are apps that will allow you to scout out locations. I've already scouted out several where I think um, I can capture a nice image of a moon setting. You want a view to the west, it's a northwest horizon, and get your apps photo pills, or I think Planet Pro is the other one. The eclipse will start around 4 a.m., will reach totality about an hour before moon set. Now, I'm going to run through this quickly. I just want to remind people, though, not to panic. I put all of the details, all of the times, all the camera settings in a document that Mick has put on the website, and uh, Gord will include an astronaut. So don't worry. Next, please. So almost all of the images in this presentation I took, this was not one of them though. This image though, in my mind, exemplifies what we might hope for with this lunar eclipse because it will be descending um, close to the horizon near dawn. As a result, there could be some lighting issues because the sky will start getting brighter. So here's the timing. At 4.10 a.m. is when you will start to see the moon moving, uh, the sun moving across and the shadow moving across. Uh, the moon will begin to dim. The totality starts at 5.17 a.m. and the moon will set at 6.54. So there is about an, an hour of a partial phase and then you have almost an hour and 45 minutes of totality. So don't panic. You can be in totality. You can take your time, you can adjust everything. But you'll see that nautical twilight begins at 648 and civil twilight begins at 622. So your sky is gonna start getting bright. And that would be one of the tricky things. I think you may have to adjust your lighting. Next, please. What gear do you need? Well, ideally you have a camera you can operate in a fully manual mode. You will want manual focus because it's hard to focus on the moon. Do your focusing, even the day before, the week before, go out, focus on the moon, practice focusing, and then tape that focus down. I have a, my focus is taped down. I, I almost never move it for the moon. You need a long lens. What I have here is a 400 uh, millimeter lens. I actually have a solar filter on, but just ignore that. You want a tripod because the tripod will hold a camera with a big lens steady, particularly if you start doing a little longer exposure. Optional, not necessary. You could have a remote shutter so you can press the shutter without actually touching the camera. And this is kind of important. If you have a star tracker, use it. You will thank me later and I'll tell you why a tracker will be critical. You don't need a tracker, but if you have one and you use it, you will be happy. All right, next, please. Okay, I should have talked about this before. The camera that you use will be important as well as the lens. If you use a DSLR, you'll know that there are full frame uh, sensors that are big and crop sensor cameras where the sensor is smaller. You may want to use your crop sensor camera for the moon. By using a crop sensor camera, my 400 millimeter lens basically acts like a 600 millimeter lens. So a smaller sensor is actually better. So I'm going to give you a couple of images now so you can see 
the moon at different focal lengths, and that'll help you decide which view you want or, or which lens you want to use, because it will make a difference. Uh, a 400 millimeter lens on a crop sensor will give you this level of detail. Next, please. Now, this is an 85 millimeter um, lens. You still see the moon, you can still get some detail, but you'll get more of the surrounding sky. Next, please. This is a 20 millimeter lens. It's very pretty if you have a nice landscape and you have the Milky Way, but the moon isn't really doing much. It's there, it's overexposed, and it's just a red glow. It's a different look, and it depends what lens you want to use. Next, please. I don't recommend uh, an iPhone simply because there's a couple of difficulties in the, the camera itself has trouble dealing with the inherent brightness of the moon. And it doesn't, again, it's usually a very wide angle lens, so you won't get a lot of detail. The exception would be if you decide to attach your iPhone to an eyepiece looking through a, a telescope, then I think you have potential to get uh, some nice images with a, with a cell phone. Next, please. Okay, so you have decided on your camera, you've decided which lens, you have a tripod, you know which direction to face. The camera settings are where people get always get concerned. So remember that essentially the moon is pretty bright, so you don't need super fast lenses. You don't typically get super fast with zoom lenses in any event. Test your starting settings in the days before the moon lunar eclipse. You practice on the actual moon. And your initial settings will probably be, you could start with these, four, uh, ISO 400, F11 aperture, and 1 250th of a second. You can go pretty quick with a full bright moon. So start there. Practice manual focus. You want manual exposure as well. As you see though, as the eclipse progresses, the moon will get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. So all the way along, you increase your exposure time, increase your exposure time. It's a pretty slow moving event, so bracket. Do, do both sides of your exposure, experiment. Just take a whole bunch of images. You can pick the best one later. This is a critical point though. At some point, you cannot expose any longer. If you do on a fixed tripod longer than one to two seconds, you will get uh, motion. The moon will move too much and you'll get blur of the features. Next, please. This was uh, the lunar eclipse in May, which was considered to be one of the very darkest um, lunar eclipses in a very long time. It is so dark, you can see in my image here that you can see stars right next to the full moon. So you will need a bit of a longer exposure to capture a fully eclipsed moon. Next, please. Well, this has kind of gotten very small, but basically you have two choices here. If you are on a fixed tripod, you cannot expose longer than one or two seconds you will have to start doing other things to compensate for the lack of light. If you can open up your lens, open up the aperture, do that. Go to uh, bigger and bigger apertures. Once you've done that, if it's still very dim, and you can check your histogram, it's a very long period of totality. Increase your ISO. So you wanna try to get your histogram towards the center on a fixed tripod. So you're going to likely have to increase your um, ISO and you may and you will have to open up your lens wide open. But if you are on a star tracker, you don't need to do that. You can just keep increasing your exposure, increasing and increasing your exposure. Most trackers have a lunar tracking uh, speed. So the other benefit of a tracker is once you have the moon in your sight, it's going to stay centered for the whole three, four hours. If you're on a tripod, you're gonna to have to keep moving the moon a little bit. The last lunar eclipse, at totality, I had almost eight seconds um, exposure of the fully eclipsed moon on a tracker. So if you have one, use it. I mean, why not? It's a good opportunity, but you don't need to. 
but you shouldn't expose beyond one or two seconds. Um, I think that's it. Go to the next slide, please. Yes, and take lots of pictures and send them to me. The one last thing I did want to mention, though, if you are using a star tracker, try to attach a ball head. As your camera is tracking the moon, it will start to tilt towards the horizon. And remember, eventually, you may want to have a picture of the, of the fully eclipsed moon with a level horizon. If you have a ball head, then it's pretty easy just to adjust at, during totality, adjust it, and you'll have a nice straight horizon. And those are my tips for lunar eclipses. I know a lot of people did it last month. They, they were uh, last uh, spring, they were great. Um, but try to get even more light if you can. And Oscar made a point here, I don't know if everyone sees it, that if you stop down your aperture, the aperture will reduce the resolving power of the lens. So I, I mean, Oscar, I guess you're suggesting that first you should maybe try to increase the ISO before you open up your, uh, your lens too much. But you have time, you can experiment with both. That's it. Andrea, okay. you may have you also have noticed uh, a chat from yeah. uh, a comment from Mark that uh, if you use an iPhone with a third party app that, that makes it essentially manual, you can then control your, um, your exposure better. Yeah, I, I think that would almost be required. Um, you can get apps that turn your iPhone into kind of like a, a can do long exposures, can you know do some more adjustments. Some of them can even shoot in raw. Uh, but you would still need a tripod and you would still be faced with any limitations of the iPhone lens, which is very wide. Not impossible for sure, but more challenging. And obviously the wider your lens, you can shoot a little longer without blur, but if you want a close up shot of the, of the moon, it's gonna move a little bit. Um, oh, and everything is on the website. If you want more information, you can email me and ask me any questions as well. Andrea. Thank you very much. All good practical stuff. Just what we need. And in fact, it gives me the inspiration that probably one of the next Techie Tip sessions is, needs to be someone to actually show how to actually demonstrate polar aligning a tracking mount. Because I'm sure that that is a, um, a bit of a learning curve for someone that's getting into this, this business. But that's for next year, I guess. So thank you. Chris, Andre, I forgot to answer your question, Vic, about what color the duct tape is, has to be used to uh, to uh, lock in the focus. Yes, what color duct tape do you use? I use black gaffer's tape. It's a low tack tape, so it, when you, it doesn't leave a bunch of tack of right goofy stuff all over your lens. That's what I use, and it happens to be black, but I think it could be in any other color. Thank you for that insight. Okay, Chris, I believe we're up to our observation reports. Um, who do we have? So I'll be starting with Mark, please. Okay, here I am. Um, so in keeping with the idea that uh, you don't need a telescope and a whole lot of equipment to do things, again, looking over my right shoulder is the equipment that was used to take these pictures. Um, this uh, this first picture, I on the, the night of the 2nd of July, I drove down to the North Frontenac site, which for me was the first time I actually ever saw the Milky Way in its, in its splendor. This was not intended to be a, a trophy shot. Um, uh, and certainly now I know how to do these, do something like this a, a whole lot better. Uh, but um, there, the, I'm, I'm showing this for two reasons. The one is I was still amazed at how much light pollution was on the horizon here. And I, when I checked my angles after getting home, I realized that the, the light dome that you see on the horizon is Kingston, which is some 85 kilometers away. Uh, this was a single exposure, uh, three minutes worth with, um, well, you could, the uh, 
the the all the settings are there on the on the side of the thing. Now, why I show this is because having framed the shot, then I recentered. If you move to the next slide, next slide, please. There, so I, I recentered so that the box that you see was actually in the center of the frame using that lens. And then I simply changed lenses on the camera without change, without moving anything else and took the next picture. Next slide. And with the, um, oh, I've got to, I've got to keep up here, hang on. <laughs> so this is the, um, about uh, 10 minutes worth of exposure, 30 seconds each with a 35 millimeter lens. So again, um, uh, next slide, please. I took that, I took, having taken that picture, I, uh, I simply recentered the camera on the frame that I've drawn there, changed lenses again to a 200 millimeter lens and got this. Next slide. And was even uh, even before getting it home and stacking it and doing all of the uh, doing all of the magic I could see in the individual frames that I had done something spectacular. At least I thought that was spectacular. And of course, because it was out there in the dark and it was above the horizon, I took this one last trophy shot. So last slide, please. Because I had to. And I was extremely happy with the way this, this particular one turned out. So uh, again, for, uh, for those who wonder, the, what you see behind me there is, the, is what took that picture it's a uh, crop frame Sony uh, DSLR with a, um, I think it's actually about 20 years old, um, a, a Minolta 200 millimeter lens. So that's what I have uh, to share for tonight. Right. Um... Mark, uh, did I hear you just volunteer to do a, a techie session showing us how polar alignment is done? Um, no, you I didn't hear that, but I will do that. Yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> thank you. I, the, uh, yes, I'm, I'm using the Star, uh, the Star Adventure 2i, and I'm quite happy to uh, explain how I, set, how I set that up. All right, so, yes, thank I you. I'll come that. back and harass you next year. Oh, very well. Okay, thank you. All right, Chris. And over to Calvin. Oh, that's lovely. Okay, so this is the, the Heart Nebula. It's pretty familiar to, to many people. Um, I just, uh, it's in Cassiopeia, so it's high in our northern skies. It's a relatively close target to us. Uh, it's uh, well within our kind of our area of the Milky Way. It's not, it's not right next door like Orion, but it's... Uh, it's sort of uh, nearby in the Milky Way. Um, it's obviously, you know, I think we've probably all seen this before. <laughs> it's a very common object. Um, I find it, uh, I think it's probably really difficult to do, to look at visually, but when it's astrophotography, it's quite easy. Um, and it's near, near the soul. So often you see the heart and soul together. Um, it's about two degrees across, so that makes it fairly large. Which helps to you know keep uh, keep the keep the stars from floating and things like that. <laughs> so it's a bit easier because it's so big. It's much bigger than the moon, for example. Um, yeah. So you know, for so now I'll talk a bit about my my image here. Uh, I've had other images of this, and 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 if you if you've taken images of this, you probably know that it's it's red. <laughs> uh, it's very hard to get other colors. Uh, the 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 hydrogen alpha uh, signal just completely dominates. Um, but I was aware that there was a, a bit of blue uh, av available in this. Um, so this image, I'll just, just sort of mention uh, what it is. Um, I took um, I took image with a with a one shot color camera, so red R RGB, and I also took um, some hours of data with just hydrogen alpha narrowband imaging and also oxygen three narrowband imaging, which is the blue color. 
Um, and it's a, I did a trick, which is that I used the hydrogen alpha channel uh, as the luminosity channel. So the benefits of that, I get very, very uh, sharp um, features and the stars are uh, kind of withdrawn. Uh, so that's due to using the the H alpha as luminosity, and then for the for the colors, I blended in the oxygen into the RGB uh, one shot image. So um, so it's kind of a bit of a, a kludge. It's a, not quite a true physical, uh, but anyway, that's that's the image, and uh, I'm quite uh, happy with it. Um, and I cropped it square uh, just just because it fits almost exactly within my my camera setup. I guess I should say I, I'm using a Rasa eleven. Uh, with a ZWO ASI 6200 camera, I, I don't use, I don't bother with any um, any flats or any darks. So next image, we'll just zoom in on the center of this. So this is just the same image. I just uh, cropped it. Um, I, I, I realized I forgot to. Normally, I do a little processing where I do a little bit of uh, um, enhancing the images, but I actually forgot to uh, to do that before I sent it in. Uh, so the actual image I have is even a little bit a uh, little bit sharper around the edges. Um, anyway, this is the the center of the the hard nebula. These are the, these are there's some very very large and bright stars that are um, producing the energy that's uh, causing the emission that you see around the red and blue emissions. Um, and um, so this is actually got it has its own name. It's Melot 15. Is this is this the center of uh, the hard nebula? And I thought by zooming in, we can see some of the other other features that I have. In, that are also there in the larger image. So that's it. Um, pretty, I think a pretty good uh, shot of the hard nebula. Beautiful detail there, Kelvin. Job well done. Uh, next up, Richard Taylor, please. Oh, still muted. Got it. Okay. <laughs> So I was inspired by Rick Wagner's um, presentation over the last few weeks. Oops, I better uh, take away the background here. To uh, get my uh, Astro Imaging Deep Sky Certificate from the RASC. That just Yay. arrived uh, September 30th. <clears throat> So what you're seeing tonight is four of the pictures from my submission for that uh, deep sky certificate. Um, this is my third try. The judges are pretty critical about your quality of work. So uh, my recommendation is uh, lots of long exposures stacked up. So, uh, this picture was taken very close to the North Frontenac Deep Sky Preserve. Um, we rent a cottage that's uh, about um, a couple of kilometers away from there, but it has a lovely uh, south facing view across a lake. So the southern uh, objects are really uh, excellent. But we were a bit later in the season this year. So um, the Eagle Nebula, it was going behind some trees. I only managed to get uh, a little bit more than an hour before it uh, disappeared behind the trees. But uh, it turned out very nicely. This is with my um, ASI 178MC color camera on the uh, William Optic Z73 telescope. And what I like about this one is that it shows uh, in the middle, the dark nebula that um, the Hubble telescope made famous, calling it the pillars of creation. Next one. And then a bit farther south, uh, just above uh, Sagittarius is the Lagoon Nebula. So we've already seen uh, one view of this tonight. Uh, what I liked about this uh, photograph was that it also included um, a uh, globular cluster just a little bit farther down, that yellow one on the bottom edge of the photograph. Um, NGC 6544 or the starfish cluster. Next one, please. This one has taken me a long time. I've, I've tried it every year for the last three or four years and uh, most of the time the uh, weather never cooperates, the clouds come over. But this year I did manage to get some good exposures and this was uh, using my um, ASI 178 as a guide camera 
so that I could take longer exposures with my Canon M100 camera on the telescope. So these were um, three minute exposures. So I got quite a lot of the detail of the spiral arms, very happy with uh, this M33 triangulum galaxy. Next one, please. And then the last item uh, in the list for the deep sky certificate is supposed to be a dark nebula. And uh, I was very happy to be able to catch this Barnard's E, which is uh, very easy to find. That very bright star on the left edge is Terra Z, which is the next bright star above Altair. So really, really easy to find. And uh, it shows up very nicely amongst the conglomeration of stars in the Milky Way. Next one, please. And my next challenge is to go for the planetary, uh, the solar system certificate. So I'm working on that now. This is another of my latest attempts at Jupiter, again with Io, the shadow of Io going across above the red spot. That was taken uh, very recently. It was uh, September 23rd, just from my backyard here in Ottawa. And that's it for me tonight. Congratulations. And thank you, Richard. Thank you. Oscar. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, I was gonna present a couple of images today. First one of which is this Jupiter here. Uh, so I took this October 2nd, I believe. Um, I don't usually do a, a lot of planetary, but uh, I just collimated my 11 inch scope. So decided to point it at a planet to see how well the collimation turned out. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it turned out okay. Um, next slide, I think I've annotated the yeah, so I captured Europa, Io, and then the uh, great red spot there on the on the very limb of the planet. Uh, so I shot this on the 11 inch uh, Edge HD with the uh, with my uh, F7 reducer on there. So not not a huge image scale, but uh, I thought it was fun just to just to shoot it. All right, next one, please. Uh, so this is an image of uh, IC 5146 or the Cocoon Nebula. Uh, the Cocoon Nebula is a stellar nursery within the Milky Way, about uh, 2,500 light years away in, in Cygnus. Uh, so this is 53 minute uh, exposures uh, stacked together for a total of two and a half hours of, uh, of integration. Uh, so it's taken the night of September 23rd with the uh, ZWASI uh, 533 uh, MC Pro uh, through an eight inch uh, HHD at F7. So it's uh, it's kind of neat because you can you can see some of the uh, dark nebulae uh, that kind of extends off of the, the main nebula uh, on the top left of the image. Uh, I was pretty pleased with how this one turned out. Next one, please. Uh, this is NGC six hundred and sixty, which is a polar ring galaxy about forty five million light years away. Uh, it's the only known galaxy of this configuration, and the ring isn't truly polar. Uh, it's it's more inclined at a 45 degree angle relative to the main uh, disk of the galaxy. Uh, this one, this image is 26 three minute exposure. So only about an hour 18 of integration. I should probably revisit this with uh, two or three or maybe four times as much integration because this is a pretty dim object. Um, but I may come back to it again at some point in the future. This was also taken with the ASI 533 MC Pro uh, through the eight inch Edge HD as well. Next one, please. So this is NGC 7380 or the Wizard Nebula, uh, which is a young open cluster of stars about 8,500 light years away uh, with a surrounding uh, emission nebula, which, which is supposed to look like a wizard. I think it kind of does. It's got little little face and, and hands and stuff there in the, in the dark nebula. Uh, so this is 66 uh, three minute exposures, so about three hours and 20 minutes or three hours and 18 minutes, I should say, uh, taking the night of September 30th, uh, again with the ASI 533 uh, through the eight inch uh, edge again uh, at F7. All right, next one, please. 
All right. So this is a, this is a project uh, I've been working on uh, since July, I believe. So this is uh, Stefan's quintet, uh, the top left, uh, NGC seven three three one, the larger galaxy there, and then the the Deerlit group, which is the the group of galaxies in the background to NGC seven three three one. Uh, so this was taken, uh, like I said, uh, it was 10 nights of uh, 10 sessions, so 10 nights, uh, total exposure of about uh, 40 hours and 45 minutes, um, 152 uh, 10 minute exposures, 308 three minute exposures. Uh, this was captured on my ASI uh, 2400 MC Pro on my 11 inch uh, Edge HD uh, at F7. Uh, so Stefan's, Stefan's quintet is those uh, five galaxies in the top left, uh, which were discovered in 1877 by Edouard Stefan. Um, it's one of the most studied uh, compact uh, group, ga uh, compact galaxy groups. Um, and only four of the five uh, galaxies are actually uh, truly physically grouped. Uh, the blue uh, oval shaped galaxy at the top of the group there is, is only visually associated. It, uh, it actually sits in the foreground about 39 million light years away, where the rest of the group is uh, between 210 and 340 million light years away. Uh, NGC 7331, which is that large spiral, is only about 40 million light years away, similar in size to the Milky Way. And at once, at one time, it was thought to be um, a twin to the Milky Way in, in structure. Uh, but uh, we've since uh, uh, discovered that the um, the Milky Way is actually a barred spiral, whereas this one is an unbarred spiral, so it's no longer considered a twin. Um, and then the Deerlick group sits in the background there, and that one's about uh, 290 million years away, 290 million light years away. Another uh, kind of neat feature of this image is that I was able to get some of the, uh, you can kind of see some of the uh, smoky texture that extends uh, just to the left of NGC 331, kind of between the Deerlick and the uh, Stefan's Quintet, and that's the IFN or the Integrated Flux Nebula, which uh, which is a type of nebula which, in contrast to our typical gaseous nebulas within our galaxy, this is actually it lies out beyond uh, the main uh, plane of of the Milky Way, and rather than being uh, illuminated uh, by a single star or a small group of stars, it's actually in, uh, illuminated by the entire integrated. Uh, flux of, of all of the stars of the Milky Way, uh, hence its its name. All right, let's say uh, next slide, please. I think I just show some crops. Yeah, so I've cropped in on Stefan's quintet there. Uh, next one, please. And uh, again, a crop of NGC 7331 in the Deer Lake group. Cool. I think that's it for me. All right, Oscar, thank you. Lots of uh, compliments coming in on the chat there for you. Job well done. Andrea, you're back. Oh, I'm just mesmerized by those images, Oscar. Wow. Um, anyway, this is Jupiter. Uh, and I'm about actually to play a little video, but before I do that, I just wanted to explain sort of why I like this video. If you do planetary imaging, people are always saying, well, you need good seeing. Well, you need good seeing. And if you don't understand what that is, you don't know what they're talking about. In this video, you can actually see the seeing improve over the night. So this was a four hour time lapse that I took. It was the same night that Richard took his image. It's September 23rd, going into the 24th. It was a beautiful night. And at the very end of this video, when the red spot was finished going across, the seeing was incredible. So I'm gonna ask Chris to press play and you'll see how it changes. Um, so that's it. I mean, if you can't really do much. If it's bad seeing, you can't get detail. If you have great seeing, then you get nice detail like this. And Chris, just hit the next slide, please. Or is this my next slide? Yeah, so this was the final. At the end of the um, time lapse, the time lapse was every six and a half minutes for four hours. It was while the red, I wanted to time it so that the red spot was crossing. I also got a little planet transiting. And 
the key with Jupiter is it rotates so incredibly fast, you need short, short exposures. So this is a color camera, 90 second exposure. That's as long as you can go with Jupiter. And at the very end of the time lapse, I did a sequence of five videos and I did some de No, I didn't do a derotation for this one, but you could do derotation. And this is my best Jupiter ever. And I'm going to retire from planetary now. I'll never do any better. And I told Tarasis and Taras told me I had to keep trying because Jupiter will be even higher next year. So we got to keep working on Jupiter. Next, please. This was a project I started at Starfest. It is the Elephant Trunk Nebula in Cepheus. And it is actually a really, really big nebula. And it's another really good target for someone like Mark with his uh, setup with a star tracker. This, kind, this was shot with my Red Cat 51 telescope, which is basically a 250 milliliter, a mil milliliter, millimeter lens. The reason I picked this target was because I was going to Starfest. I wanted a portable um, setup. So I brought a portable equatorial mount. I had my nice little small refractor. And I decided to do this image in narrow band. If you just point a DSLR at the elephant trunk, it's all pink. But if you shoot it with a monochrome camera and filters, it has that big center area of oxygen, which is the blue. And the easiest way to find this, if you're trying to find the elephant trunk, is you try use the garnet star, which is the red star up in the corner. And that's the easiest way to find the elephant trunk nebula if you're using a star tracker. And I assigned the um, I, I shot uh, one night in hydrogen, one night in sulfur, one night in oxygen. I combined the colors. I assigned the colors according to the Hubble palette. And it comes out, uh, I thought it turned out quite colorful. Next. All right, so before we um, press play, I'm just gonna give a bit of background. I was out doing some solar imaging September 30th, and I was taking some pictures and I noticed that coming around the corner of the sun was kind of a really active area. It was bubbling and gurgling. So I decided to do a time lapse of just that area as it came around the corner. As I was went in for a coffee, while well, the time lapse was running, I came out and I saw kind of an exciting thing on the sun. Excuse the dramatic music. If you hear music, it, it's the something that I put on Instagram. So it has music, so please play. Thanks, Chris. The upper uh, northeast corner is where the flare was. So this is the active region, and, th and then this happened. So I should mention that I did invert the um, the images. So when you saw all that black of the flare erupting, it was actually very, very bright light that overexposed in the camera lens. So that was an M-class flare that was on the sun, on the edge of the sun in uh, September 30th. I think, is that it, Chris? I think so. I think so. So that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And I'll just note for the audience that you will be back with us with Tony Peterson next month to be presenting on active solar regions of the sun there during the summer. There are plenty of active solar regions. Everybody should, if you have a solar scope, you got to start watching the sun. It's bananas. But looking forward to that. Thanks again. Oh. Hey there, I'm just gonna cut my video because I'm getting some chop here. How's my audio coming through? It's fine, you're good. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so good evening, everyone. I've got a couple of items for you here this evening. Uh, first one is this, uh, on the evening of October the 2nd, which was only about uh, uh, a week and a half ago, 
Uh, I was preparing to head out to FLO to continue my work on the 14-inch uh, Paul Commission telescope. Uh, just prior to leaving, I checked the Space Weather website and noticed that there was an uptick in solar activity being reported. Uh, one of the very useful links on that page is to an auroral activity forecast chart prepared by NOAA, the American uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I was quite surprised by the current uh, information showing on that page because it showed that the southern edge of the auroral oval had briefly expanded to nearly uh, down to our latitude. In addition to the map, the hemispheric power index, a measure of how much power is emanating from the activity, had shot up to an eye-opening 90 gigawatts. I usually start getting excited at the prospects of seeing auroras in our areas when this reaches this index reaches about 70 gigawatts or higher. So I grabbed my Canon 70D and 60 millimeter lens and headed out. Next one, please. So uh, the site where I shot this is, is only about half a kilometer or so uh, south of my house in a wide open field. And as soon as I got there, I could see the auroral pillars uh, poking up from the northern horizon with the naked eye and, 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 and hurried to set up my equipment. The, uh, the pillars appeared to be moving rapidly from east to west, so I wanted to start shooting as soon as possible. I could actually see the, the greenish yellow light of the pillars and just a hint of the reds higher up, but the camera also recorded the blue violet tops that uh, I'm not sure if, you, if they're coming through on your screen here, but uh, uh, definitely uh, blue at the top of the auroral pillars. Uh, you can see that these extended well into the bowl of the Big Dipper to at least 30 degrees elevation at this time. Next one, please. So you, you can see how quickly those pillars move. These views that I'm showing you, they were all captured uh, while there was a 50% a uh, illuminated moon up in the southwestern sky, and they were only just a few minutes apart. I had the uh, 16 millimeter lens set to f 2.8, uh, stop it down from its, uh, from its fully open 2.0 configuration. And the exposures were uh, 10 seconds long at ISO 3200. Next one, please. Watch the pillars. There you go. So like I said, the, the four images that I've shown you here are, are amongst the best I obtained that night. And they were all taken within the first seven minutes of my imaging start. During that time, the pillars fluctuated in brightness and structural sharpness, sometimes fading to near invisibility. And after that initial seven minutes, they were completely gone. The display then just became a diffuse greenish low, uh, glow, uh, low above the northern horizon. I stayed for a while hoping the display would uh, flare up again, but alas, it didn't. Uh, probably a good thing for me as I had other fish to fry at FLO that night. Next one, please. So, I, I thought I'd take an opportunity to provide a very quick update on uh, to the presentation uh, I made last month on the 14-inch Palm uh, Commission Memorial Telescope. And I see that uh, Jupiter has been a popular target this month, no doubt because of its uh, its opposition date. Anyway, I'm happy to announce uh, tonight that the mechanical hitches that we've had with the telescope now all appear to be resolved. It's behaving properly, and just earlier this week, I was finally able to get the polar alignment down to within 10 arc seconds of true. Uh, this opens the door to using the uh, scope's built-in go-to library with its hand controller for targeting. Uh, in conjunction with the internal smart mount and high precision pointing capabilities, the goal here is to be able to place a selected target uh, right on, the, on a camera's imaging chip. An external computer can now also be connected to the scope to precisely target uh, objects in, in that way. So in the next few days, I hope to be able to conduct our first long duration auto guided images with the scope to confirm that aspect of its operation. If that's successful, then I can finalize the user manual and we can begin opening the telescope up for training. I'll send out an email to the group when we reach this point. In the meantime, I, I thought I'd show you a, a sample of some planetary imaging done while I've been uh, working on the scope. The, this view of Jupiter was taken with a Celestron uh, Max Image 5 camera mounted on the 14 inch at its uh, F10 prime focus. The seeing that night ranged from reasonably good to somewhat unsteady over a relatively short interval. Sometimes it was very fluid, like, like watching, watching the planet through a you know, like a like a flowing stream or something, and other times it's stabilized. And and uh, that was that was a great uh, video sequence that you showed there, Andrea. Really demonstrated the uh, how quickly 
uh, uh, seeing can change um, in, in in a very short period of time, and and some sometimes it's very stable, and it can you can get stable views for for minutes or maybe even the whole night long. Although that's pretty rare in in, in our neck of the woods. Other times it's more like a like a I say as a, as a stream or a fluid flowing over the image of Jupiter or or any of the planets really. So um, anyway, this uh, this night was. Uh, I hadn't I hadn't gone out with the intention of uh, imaging Jupiter. I just it just happened to be a nice visible target there, and I was doing some testing uh, on the 14 inch. So I wasn't really too worried about uh, about the, the seeing one way or another. I just thought I'd want to grab some images just to, for some calibration purposes uh, uh, while I'm doing my testing and configuration. However, I did uh, do capture seven uh, AVI sequences. Uh, each of those were about 1,500 uh, uh, frames long. And of those, um, uh, I, uh, I would wind up choosing about the best 30. So about, you know, one in 50 frames or so. That's, I say, I find in, in our neck of the woods, um, choosing about one, one in 30 up to about one in 50 is the way to go because most of the images that you get are, are just blurry and, uh, and affected by seeing. Anyway, of those seven uh, sequences, I noticed that the moon Io was quite prominent even in the unprocessed video. Uh, so I did the stacking and processing of the best frames from each sequence and stitched those together into this very short time lapse, uh, not quite as long as Andrea's there, but uh, for a different purpose perhaps. So uh, next one, please. So this is the time lapse and, and the sequence spans about 40 minutes with about six minutes uh, between individual uh, frames here. Jupiter reached opposition just a few weeks ago, and so even the variable seeing on this particular night, uh, uh, with its proximity to us, allows a, a one to make out a fair bit of detail as the, as the planet rotates. You can see, if you've got a sharp eye there, that the seeing, again, just as in Andrea's video, varied considerably from, uh, from frame to frame. And as I said, this, this was only uh, um, 40 minutes from start to finish. Um, so I was pretty pleased with this, but as I was processing these frames, one other thought struck me. Last year, Jim Thompson and I gave a series of presentations regarding our high resolution exploration of the moon's south polar region. One of the items that came from that work was the ability to use two images that were taken fairly close to one another in time to create a three-dimensional view of the terrain. I couldn't resist trying the same here with Jupiter and Io. Next one, please. So now some folks last year had difficulty seeing the 3D effect, <clears throat> excuse me, and for others, it was pretty easy. The moonscape, moon's landscape uh, is a much more complex object to try this with uh, than the simple sphere of Jupiter that you see here. So, so give this a try. Uh, sit about a meter or so squarely in front of your monitor screen and stare at the space between the two views of Jupiter. Slightly cross your eyes and you'll see the two views start to converge. When they do, you'll see a central view of Jupiter between the left and right peripheral views, and it will be appear to be noticeably three-dimensional with Io floating above the planet. So take, take a moment and, 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 and try, to, try to pull that together. If you're successful, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see that Jupiter actually looks quite spherical as opposed to just a flat disk and Io appears to be floating above the planet. Now, try to hold this 3D view because I've got one more slide for you. <laughs> Not only did I put this together, but then I used the seven frames to do a short sequence in 3D. So if you can resolve that view of Jupiter, just hold that view, and Chris, can I get you to play the next slide? And you can see Io moving out. You can see Io almost shooting out from Jupiter as it, as it moves. Um, well, if you can resolve the effect, uh, certainly check out the rotation of features moving uh, in on the planetary disk from the left limb and moving out on the right. Uh, I, ju I just find that uh, Io's movement makes this view especially three-dimensional. Please feel free to send a yes or a no uh, to me using the chat. I'd love to know how many can actually resolve this effect because I know it's a... It's, uh, it's, uh, it's really easy for some folks, and it's a devil of a thing to try to do for others. So I'd, I'd appreciate just a, you know, just a quick yes or no. Thanks a lot. That's it for me this month. Wishing everybody clear skies, and we'll 
catch you next month. Thank you, Paul. And just so you know, I wasn't able to do it. <laughs> Mick, you may have noticed um, in the background, uh, there were some questions posed to Andrea in the Q&A, yep. which she answered directly, but they may be of interest to, uh, to others if Andrea wants to speak up to them. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't do them. I didn't answer the questions properly. There were questions about the equipment that I use. I use a Lunt 40 millimeter uh, H-alpha scope. So Lunt is a manufacturer of solar telescopes and the 40 millimeter scope is their entry level. It's really small, it's very cute and very light. And I put it on a Star Adventurer. And I use the 290mm camera, which is a, an astro camera. I began using my guide camera, but now I have a planetary version. So it's a very fast, high-speed video camera. And that's it. Thanks, Andrea. Chris, where are we up to? Challenges, yes? This month's challenges for our observers. Uh, first of all, to recap from last month, Messier 56, the Intermediate Challenge, NGC 6905. The Advanced Challenge was UGCA 429. I don't think anyone had a go at that. Uh, nor the lunar crater Longinomantis, Martinus, Montanus, Longinomantis. Uh, so this month's challenge is Chris. The beginner challenge NGC 281, AKA the Pac-Man Nebula that hasn't been politically corrected to Pac person yet, uh, which is a hydrogen two region in Cassiopeia, uh, about half a degree apparent size and a 7.4 apparent magnitude. So a, a, a good catch for, uh, for our starter operas. Intermediate challenge is a pair of um, nebula regions, IC59 and IC63, again in Cassiopeia, uh, a combination of emission and reflection nebulae known as the ghost of Cassiopeia. Uh, parent magnitude 10, slightly harder target to acquire. Next one, Chris. Sorry, I was checking my phone there. The advanced challenge. Mirax Ghost, a face, face on lenticular galaxy at Andromeda, designated NGC 404. Uh, Three by three minutes, so it's not huge. Uh, it's a challenge in the sense that at 10th magnitude, it's going to be a, a hard to bag given its proximity to Mirage at second magnitude. So to recap, this month's challenge, oh, sorry, the lunar challenge, Mare Aguis, aka the Serpent Sea, uh, it's an extension of Mare Crisium on the northeast limb of the moon, about 130 kilometers average diameter. So to recap, NGC 281, the, the nebulae pair IC59 and 63, all those in Cassiopeia, NGC 404, and Mare Unguius as the lunar challenge. Next, please. The rest calendars have arrived. They are available for pickup. I've got a pile of them on my dining room table. Uh, there's still a couple available for purchase through the secretary at ottawa.rest.ca, aka Chris. They're available at $16 each and 30, 30 bucks for two or $10 each for two or more. And for non-members, they're available at $20. And I've had a look at them and it's gorgeous. Next, please. The Fred Lossing Observatory, fully open for business. Uh, new equipment coming online, as you heard from Paul. This is a members only facility. Uh, guests are welcome, and your own equipment uh, obviously can be brought out and set up on the mounds. Uh, so let's make the most of the 
the longer nights and earlier twilights and uh, hopefully see you out there. By the way, Paul, if you're taking guinea pigs on the 14 inch, can you sign me up? Thank you. All right, next one, please. O only guinea quackers. Okay. Guinea quackers, thank you. Uh, October 22nd, next FLO star party against a, a waning crescent moon. So it could be quite a good evening, weather being on our side, we would hope. Next one. The directory of uh, who does what in the club, including my earlier gaffe about the Ted Bean Equipment Loan Library, Darren Weatherall, uh, is the person to contact or you can do it as a uh, you'll find an email address on the website under the center information for the loan uh, ed bean librarian and uh, chris i think we got up to about 90 tonight what did you say that's exactly the number i would estimate mm -hmm. yeah okay so i i hope a number of those were our um our friends from the school the kids um, and so thanks to our guest speakers, Jesse and Cassandra and Sean Clark, uh, our usual gang of suspects, Dave, Andrea, uh, with Mark, Calvin, Richard and Oscar and Paul. And as always, thanks to the RASC National Office for providing these Zoom facilities that have kept our meetings going uh, all through these COVID eras, eras, years. Uh, comments, ideas, suggestions about future presentations to me at uh, meeting chair at ottawa.rast.ca. Tonight's meeting video, as well as the presentations, the challenges, and astronauts when Gordon ships it out, will all be available on our fabulously well provisioned website at ottawa.rast.ca. And finally, the next meeting will be. Back to the first Friday of the month, November 4th, at 7.30 p.m. Again, it'll be a Zoom webinar. I'm still hoping to get back to our venue. Thank you to you all for coming along tonight. Hoping to see you and more next month. And clear skies all around. Cheers.